Our scripture today is from the book of 1 Peter, chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. We will uh, just take the verses as we come to them this morning. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you once again uh, for the privilege of being gathered here together as your children. We thank you, Father, for your love toward us and for this book that you've given to us and for the indwelling Holy Spirit to help us take the words from the page and put them into practice. Father, we know that our lives fall far short of your glory, but we are thankful, Father, for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has bridged that gap on our behalf. We recognize, Father, that we are sinful creatures uh, beset by many sins in our daily life, but we thank you, Father, for the privilege again this morning to come before you. We just pray, Father, uh, that as we look into your word, we'll be mindful of your love for us and that these instructions are for your glory and also for our good. It's in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ we ask this prayer and give you the praise. Amen. It was a young preacher who had just begun his sermon. I uh, hadn't preached very many sermons, and so he was uh, pretty nervous. As he was preaching about the coming of the Lord, he said, Behold, I come quickly. And then his mind went blank. Uh, it was a brief moment of sudden panic. He didn't know what he was going to do. But he remembered that he had learned in seminary that in situations like this, you repeat your last phrase that you just said, and then hopefully the words would come to you where you were going to go next. So he said it again. Behold, I come quickly. With a little more emphasis, but still his mind was blank. So he tried a third time, more forcefully, stepped back, rushed up to the pulpit and said, Behold, I come quick, but he tripped over the pulpit, fell forward, tripped over the flowers in the front, fell in the lady's lap in the front row. Oh, he was so embarrassed, apologized profusely, but the lady said, No, 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 it's my fault. I should have moved. You warned us you were coming. <laughs> As we look at the verse this morning in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7, it says, but the end of all things is at hand. That's how Peter begins this morning in our passage that we're going to be studying. Uh, that's in the King James and the New King James. It's at hand. The New American Standard and the NIV says near. The end of all things is near. You know, the saints of the first century anticipated that the return of Jesus Christ would be in their lifetime. We have a couple of clues that it wouldn't be that way for all of them, though. As we mentioned last week, the Lord had actually told Peter, as recorded in the book of John, chapter 21, verses 20 through 23, that Peter was going to die for his testimony for Christ. Obviously, that would happen before Christ would return to set the world in order. So why does Peter say here that the end of all things is near or at hand, yet some 2,000 years later, here we are, still waiting. End of all things has not come yet. I brought an entire sermon on this topic in June of 2021, June of last year. It was when James said much the same thing in James chapter 5 and verse 7, that the coming of the Lord was near at hand. The title of that sermon is When, from June of 2021 on James chapter 5 and verse 7. It's available on our website uh, in audio or in podcast form. Also, it's available on YouTube if you prefer the video format. So I'm not going to rehash that statement this morning and spend a whole sermon on it again. Uh, if you have questions about this statement, please look up that sermon and listen to it for a full explanation. And then if you still have questions, then feel free to reach out to me. I'm always available to answer questions. But make no mistake about it, the Lord will return. Here's a few interesting facts for you. In the New Testament, it's estimated that one of every 30 verses referred to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ in some form or fashion. For every Old Testament prophecy concerning the first coming of Jesus Christ, there are about eight prophecies concerning the return of Jesus Christ. So he is returning. No matter the timeline, one thing is certain. We're closer today to his return than they were, we were yesterday. At least one day closer. 
Last week, I referenced the fact that we will have to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and give an account of our lives. And that day is rapidly approaching. So with that in mind, Peter gives us some instructions on how we are to live in our daily life until it's our time to leave. First of all, he says, we must live cautiously. Look at the end of the verse uh, or the next phrase in the verse. First Peter chapter 4 and verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious, it says in the New King James. The King James says, be sober. The NIV says, therefore, be alert. The New American Standard says, be of sound judgment. Those are all good renderings of the Greek word that's used here. When we think of being sober, as it says in the King James Version, we often think of that as the opposite of drunkenness. And of course, there's some basis for that interpretation here. Uh, again, the, the word that's used here can mean to be of sound, excuse me, to be of sound judgment, uh, to act wisely, to be clear-minded, to be cautious. It also carries the idea of having self-control or being moderate. The point is that we need to understand the environment that we are in today. How things are and the age in which we are living. Paul told us the same thing in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Turn back with me there. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Paul starts off by saying that we are in perilous times in the last days. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Starting with verse 1, we're going to read the first five verses here of 2 Timothy chapter 3. Paul says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. You know, Paul goes through this list of all the sinful activities that will be happening in the last days, and one of the things that makes it perilous is that it's completely socially acceptable to act this way. But another thing I think that makes it perilous is how these things also work themselves into the psyche of the church the body of Christ. Paul says that these things even have a form of godliness in verse 5, but deny the power thereof. We certainly see that in the church today. A form of godliness, but denying the power. The power of godliness is in Jesus Christ. Too many churches today deny that the Bible is the inerrant word of God, and they change it, you know, to suit their own human reasoning. They deny that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the sinless Son of God, that he is the only way to heaven through faith in his shed blood on the cross of Calvary. We look around the world around us today and we see that right is wrong and wrong is right. We see that sin is celebrated and righteousness is vilified. We see that Christians are public enemy number one. And ungodliness is publicly promoted as the answer to happiness in people's lives. It's insanity is what it is. We must study the word of God to carefully navigate the world in which we are living today. We must live soberly, cautiously, with sound judgment. Otherwise, we can be led astray. And that's what Paul said next in writing to Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, turn with me there. If you're already there in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 4, the first four verses here, Paul said to Timothy, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Timothy is to do what? Preach the word. Priority number one, preach the word. We need to study the word of God. He says, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching or doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, 
but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. You see what happens when you reject the truth of God's word? It says you will turn away, they will turn away. That's a willing choice, you see. But once you do that, oh, Satan has all kinds of schemes to ensnare you. He says, once you turn away from the truth, you will be turned to fables. We must live cautiously in this age in which we live, and that requires the study of the Word of God. We must also live prayerfully. Prayerfully. John Phillips says, watching sights the enemy, praying fights the enemy. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and be watchful in your prayers. Watching sights the enemy, praying fights the enemy. The purpose of being sober and watchful is for the purpose of praying accurately, properly. When we have self-control and the proper mindset, then we can also pray effectively. If our senses are attuned to God's will, then we can see the whole picture of what's going on. And that's very beneficial for us as Christians to see and understand the whole picture. And then we can stand strong, you see, even if pain and suffering lies ahead for us in our future. There's an old saying that goes, when we fail to pray, we are sure to fail. That's true for you, fellow Christian. When we fail to pray, we are sure to fail. We must live prayerfully because if we don't set our mind right for the strength that we need for what lies ahead, we will fail. As for watching and praying, I'm sure that Peter's own failure in this regard was in his mind in the Garden of Gethsemane when the Lord asked him to do the same thing. Turn back to Matthew chapter 26. This should stand as a warning to us. Matthew chapter 26, we'll start reading with verse 36 as they enter the Garden of Gethsemane after the Last Supper. It says, Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, O my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. What happened after this? It's not but just a few hours later that Peter tragically denies even knowing his beloved Lord. You see, he didn't watch and pray with the Lord. His mind wasn't right. He wasn't sober for the occasion of the situation that he was going to find himself in. With Satan going about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour as Peter will later say in chapter 5 and verse 8, no wonder the apostle urged us, God's people, to be watchful, vigilant, prayer warriors. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you went to God and agonized in prayer about something? When was the last time you went to God and agonized in prayer about the condition of the world that we find ourselves in today? When was the last time you agonized in prayer over the fact that there may be co-workers or friends or even family around you that right now may be headed to hell? 
maybe you can be the testimony and the witness that will help God's love reach them. When's the last time you asked God for that opportunity? Begged him for that opportunity, agonizing over it. When was the last time you missed sleep for Bible study? When was the last time you missed sleep because you stayed awake deep into the night in prayer and fellowship with God? Hey, turn the TV off once in a while, okay? Spend some serious time with God. Plead with God for your child, your spouse, your, your loved ones, your friends, your coworkers. Get on your knees and ask him for the boldness and the courage to be a witness for him for the opportunity to be that witness. Sidlow Baxter once said, men may spurn our appeals, reject our message, oppose our arguments, and despise our person, but they are helpless against our prayers. Do you believe that? We are to be people of prayer. Paul said we are to pray without ceasing. Prayer is a vital part of the Christian life. We can't find success without it. We're to live prayerfully. We also see that we must live fervently while we we are here. Look at verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8. Peter says, And above all things have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Peter quotes an old Hebrew proverb here. By that I mean it's a quote from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 12. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. Um, The Greek word for fervent here. Peter says we are to have a fervent love for one another. It's used here, and it's only used one other time in Scripture. The other time that it's used is when Peter was arrested and imprisoned by Herod with the intent of executing him the next day. In Acts chapter 12 and verse 5, it tells us that there was a group of believers gathered together there praying for him without ceasing. It's the same Greek word there that is translated fervent love here. A love that doesn't cease. Consistent, you see. In the context of this verse, we are called to fervently, continually, consistently demonstrate love in our life. Okay, but uh, what kind of love? I love chocolate. I do, that's a true statement. Is it that kind of love? Is it just a love in general? Is it a passing kind of love? Is it a brother, brotherly kind of love? Where I'm just called to be you know, somewhat affectionate to people around me? No. That's not it. The love here, or in the King James, as it says, charity is agape. It's an unconditional love. Love that goes out of its way to be thoughtful, to be kind, to be gentle, to be forgiving. It's a sacrificial kind of love. It's an unselfish love. This is the love that's not extended because of of what we might get in return by doing so, you see. It's a love so great that it loves the unlovable. It's the kind of love that God has for us. And we are called to have that kind of love for the people around us. Remember, when Peter wrote this, what's the background here? The background is Christians are suffering. Nero is having Christians arrested, rounded up, tortured, and killed. Many of the people that Peter is writing to already had family and friends to whom this had happened. And Peter says we are to have fervent love. Even the Lord Jesus Christ told us we are to love our enemies. Sometimes our kindness is the only way we're going to reach the people who hate us. That's why we have to love our enemies. You see, it's the kind of love that requires the Christian to put another person's spiritual need ahead of their own physical comfort. So you understand now why Peter said that? Why the Lord said we are to love our enemies? Because it might be the only way we can reach them to save their soul. It's the kind of love that puts another person's spiritual need 
above our own personal comfort. The Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 4, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And Peter says here that love covers a multitude of sins. And I said that's a quote from Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 12. This means that a Christian should overlook wrongs against them. At times, we need to be ready to forgive those, even those who harm us. This forgiving love was spoken of by Jesus in answer to Peter's question when Peter asked him, how many times shall I forgive my brother? Seven times? You know, maybe seven? And Jesus said, no. What did he say? Seventy times seven. It's not an exact number, by the way. Don't keep a tablet of how how many times, you know, until you get there. That's not the point. Jesus' point was we need to fervently love, continually love, unconditionally. Have you ever heard one child tell another child, I am not going to be your friend unless you do so and so? This is putting conditions on the friendship, you see. This is putting conditions on our love, and we learn to do it at a young age. Sometimes we forget that Jesus loves us unconditionally. You know, Jesus never said, I will love you if. Never said it. He said, if you, if you love me, there are things you will do. But he never said, I will love you if. That's not in the Bible. He will love you whether or not you read your Bible. He will love you whether or not. You come to church because that's God's kind of love, an unconditional love. And this is the kind of love that we are called to share with the people around us. It's the kind of love that will point the lost to Christ. This love is to be fervent, you see, without ceasing, continual, consistent in our life. Let us love one another and continue to do so. The apostle says we are to fervently love. That certainly applies to our brethren, but you know, it's, it's to the world around us as well. To the lost, to the unbelievers also. This fervent love will produce benevolence, generosity, and hospitality. Notice it's the next thing that he says. We are to live benevolently. Benevolently, I said, while we are here. Look at verse 9. It says, be hospitable one to another without grumbling. Uh, In the King James, it says, use hospitality one to another without grudging. The Greek word here for hospitality means exactly what you would think it to mean. It's one of those Greek word pictures where it's a word, but it, it calls to mind an image. And the image here is of hosting other people, of being friendly to strangers, of entertaining guests. In Peter's day, fellow believers would frequently open up their home to travelers. People who needed a bed for a night, a meal or two. They would care for other needy Christians and they would host traveling preachers such as the apostles. When Jesus first sent out the 12, he sent them out and he said, carry nothing with you. Why? They were to just depend on the hospitality of others whom they would meet, who would open up their home to them. Paul planned to go to Colossae when he got released from prison. In fact, he wrote a letter called Philemon. It's called that because that's who it's to, a man named Philemon. And in verse 22 of that letter, he told Philemon, prepare for me a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. He was confident that the Lord was going to allow him to be released from prison on this occasion and that he would come back then to visit Colossae. And while he was there, that Philemon would open up his home and give him a place to stay. I spoke before of Peter's imprisonment in Acts chapter 12 and that the church was gathered together constantly in prayer, praying without ceasing for Peter. He was delivered from that situation and immediately he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, 
because he knew that there he would be given he would be given lodging isn't it interesting that that's where everybody else was also gathered in her home she was given to hospitality and peter knew it there are several other examples of believers extending hospitality in the scriptures as we have occasion we are called to do the same to use hospitality peter says without grumbling without grudging don't be like the man who took his dog to the vet and told the veterinarian i want you to cut my dog's tail off all of it cut it completely off and the veterinarian said i i don't like to do that and there's nothing wrong with his tail why do you want it cut off completely he said well my mother-in-law is coming to visit I don't want anything in the house to suggest to her that she's welcome. <laughs> Peter's point in all of this is that we are to focus on the end goal. And what is our purpose? What is the end goal in all of it? It's that we are working together for the cause of Christ. We are working together to reach people for Jesus Christ. We must be hospitable toward each other along the way. Benevolence is the desire to do good things for other people. We should be benevolent to all men, especially those of the faith. We see that also we are to live generously while we are here. Look at verse 10. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. You know, as believers, we are all given gifts, every one of us. We're all given a gift of something that we are good at. Spiritual gifts, we can call it. We have no grounds to be proud of these gifts that we've been given because it's a gift from God through the Holy Spirit. God sovereignly bestows upon each one of us some kind of gift and a gift that we can use in the church even. Paul covers this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 specifically verses 4 through 7, but he's talking there about the body of Christ and how we're all different, not the same. We're not robots. We all have our own individual personality. We also have our own individual gift that we can use in the service of the Lord, and we are to be good stewards of that gift, whatever it is, or gifts. Some people are multi-talented, and they have gifts. The word used here of a steward, being a good steward of our gifts, is the word that's primarily used of someone who is an estate manager. Such a person would be held accountable for what they did with all the things that were entrusted into their care in a specific home or estate. In the Old Testament, Joseph is one of those. He was a steward in Potiphar's house. He was a slave for Potiphar, that's true, but Potiphar entrusted everything in his house to Joseph for him to take care of it. Joseph was the steward, you see, of Potiphar's estate, caring for everything in his estate. This is recorded back in Genesis chapters 39, 40, and 41. When we use our gifts, the Holy Spirit ministers to others through us, through the use of our gift. So the spiritual gifts that are given to us are not for our benefit. The spiritual gifts that are given to us are for the benefit of others. That's why we've been given that gift, to use it for God to serve others, to help others, to reach others. When we don't, it's a tragic loss. It's a terrible thing. The church suffers. You know, Peter could have easily used the geographical surroundings of his own area to illustrate this point here. He had spent most of his days on the Sea of Galilee. You see the water from the Jordan River flowed into the Sea of Galilee, also called uh, Lake Gennesaret at one point. Technically it's a lake, but it's called the Sea of Galilee. The water flowed in from the Jordan, flowed around the wide, bountiful body of water, and then exited out the southern end, continuing on its course. From there, the life-giving water went down and down and further down until 65 miles later, it entered into the Dead Sea, 1,300 feet below sea level. 
Unlike the Sea of Galilee, which received the waters from above, spread them around bountifully, and then poured that life-giving water on down the line, the Sea of Galilee received all and gave nothing. Kept it. Or excuse me, the Dead Sea, excuse me. Received it all and kept it. As a result, it's just what its name declares. A Dead Sea. Devoid of meaningful life arid, bitter, yielding nothing of value but salt. As believers, we've been given gifts from above. We're to be like the Sea of Galilee. We're just stewards of that gift. We're called to generously share with those around us whatever our gift is. If, like the Dead Sea, we just receive and we never give, selfishly hoarding everything for ourselves, then we become a bitter taste to God's generosity toward us. God's gifts are linked with God's grace. They are for the blessing, for the benefit of not only us, but those around us as well. We're only the stewards, Peter says. Stewards of this gift that we've been given. A steward is responsible for the resources of someone else. The gifts aren't ours. They're his. God's. The gift of the Holy Spirit working in and through us. And they are to bring glory to God. We're going to be held accountable. We're going to stand before the Lord, and we're going to be held accountable for whether we did or didn't use the gift that God gave us to further his glory and to serve the church, the body of Christ. Let us be good stewards of God's gracious gift. And finally, we are to live faithfully while we are here. Keep in mind that Peter continues here against the backdrop of horrendous suffering. Persecution. We sometimes as preachers harp on the fact that our actions have to match our words. What do we call that? There's an old saying for that. Practice what you preach. Practice what you preach. But listen, the practice without the preaching isn't good either. You need to do the preaching as well. While the daily practice is addressed, you know, in our actions, those actions do need to be backed up by our words. First of all, Peter reminds us that we must faithfully testify of the word of God. Look at verse 11. He says, if any man speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. Oracles, word of God. We must give verbal testimony of God's word, the Bible, the Holy Scriptures. You know, we've heard the old saying, uh, you may be the only Bible that some people will ever read. Talking about our actions. But you know what? you may be the only preacher that some people will ever hear. That's true as well. Speak the oracles of God. If any man speaks, let him speak the word of God. We need to make it clear that we aren't advancing some philosophy of man about life and how it's to be lived, but we are living out the inerrant, God-breathed message of the living God that we serve. And just because believers were facing terrible deaths for proclaiming God's word was not a reason to remain silent or dilute God's message, as Peter wrote to them. And the same holds true for us today. We are to speak the word of God. Not only are we to be faithful to the word of God, but also to the work of God. Continuing, verse 11, If any man speak, let him speak the oracles of God. If anyone ministers... Let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. Minister, you see, to serve. To look out for other people around you. Peter already said that's what we need to do. But let's make sure when we're doing it that it's clear that it's the work of God that's being carried out. The ministry required of us here is according to our God-given ability. Again, we've all been gifted. Don't undersell yourself. There's some way that you can serve the Lord and the body of Christ. And we are put here to work. I said a week or two ago, we're not dust filters. You know, a dust filter just sits there and collects dust. 
That's its job. That's not us. We're not called to just sit around and collect dust. We're to work. We're to work for the Lord. It's his duty. We have a duty, excuse me, uh, we have a duty to allow God to work through us. It's his gift to us to allow him to do that. It's his working through us that should also bring him glory. So we have a responsibility to be faithful to the worship of God as well. Verse 11 in its whole, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God or the word of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things he may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Whether we preach or teach or witness or whatever it is, the, the message is not ours. It's Christ. If we have a, a serving gift, it's not to bring us glory. It's to bring glory to God. Don't do it for the pat on the back. Don't do it for the personal recognition. Do it out of love for your fellow man and out of a desire, a sincere desire, to bring glory to God. And then Peter finishes, finishes it off here, to whom belong glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. It's a sudden outburst of praise from Peter. As he's talking about how we should live and how it should be to bring God glory, suddenly in thinking about God's glory, he just says, you know, forever and ever. Amen. Remember, this is against a backdrop of terrible suffering. Terrible suffering. But you know what Peter knew? You know what God knew? You know what he's trying to get across to the people? Nero's reign is terrible, but how long is it going to be? Is it going to be forever? No. It would only be for a short time. In fact, the Roman Empire wouldn't be forever. No. Nope. One day all sin and suffering will be behind us. We will rule and reign with Christ in glory when God's glory will be revealed in us for how long? Forever and ever. Amen. Praise God. In the meantime, while we're here, regardless of what's taking place around us, whether it be suffering, whether it be war, Whatever the turmoil is, we are instructed how we are to live here until it's our time to leave here. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this time once again that we've had to look into your word. We thank you, Father, that you've not left us alone with a book, but indwelled us with the Holy Spirit of God to give us the power to put into practice the life that we should live. We are thankful, Father, for the gifts that you have given us and how you continue to shower your grace and love upon us. May we also faithfully continue in love to those around us. Father, we recognize that we are weak, we are frail, we are sinful. Many times we get off the path that we should be on, but we're thankful that you are a faithful God, coaxing us back, joyous in our return, and ready and willing to work in us further. For any who have strayed, Father, that have not been living up to this example here before us today. May they return to you, Father, knowing that you will welcome them with rejoicing, open arms. May we all be mindful, straying or not, that we have a job to do, that we are put here to work, that we are stewards of the gift that you've given us. May we be faithful then in living it out in our daily life. It's in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ we ask this prayer.